This now announcement is make sure you silence your cell phones. Do not turn them off because we encourage you to tweet or text the number 37607 using IST Startup um, to have questions for our Q&A session. Um, so I just want to thank you again for coming. And I would like to welcome Jane Rikers, Paul Sissi, how do you say Cianciolo. Cianciolo, <laughs> John Kim, and Del Dan Veltri and Bob Morgan for being on this panel today. So will you please give them a round of applause? Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming early this morning. Uh, we have uh, four great speakers here that uh, are going to enlighten you on a lot of different topics. Uh, um, I myself, um, I'm just here to moderate and make sure that uh, these guys give you a lot of good information that you can tweet out. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, so I've been in the position where I've been looking for capital. So when they say, show me the money, I've, I've had the opportunity to go through the process. Um, the folks here on the panel uh, have been in both situations where they've actually going after funding and actually have, have been doling out funding and investing in companies. So we've got a really diverse group of people that hopefully can provide you a lot of insight. And, you know, when it sounds like a little catchy phrase and, you know, I'm not sure who came up with it, show me the money, but there, it's, it's quite a complicated and daunting process to actually go through it. And hopefully we have a lot of entrepreneurs sitting in this room and you have an opportunity to experience the process. Uh, so what I've tried to do is come up with some questions that kind of go through that process. And uh, we're going to give each of the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and then also share their advice and opinions on what to do, what not to do. Uh, a lot of times we learn, uh, as you all know, through problem-based learning. I uh, learn from other people's mistakes, so hopefully they can share some other horror stories that uh, they've experienced that hopefully you, you won't fall into that trap. So I'm going to start off with each one of these gentlemen and ask them to do a brief introduction, uh, but also while they're doing an introduction, you know, share a little bit about their background and actually share a story, uh, whether it's being, you know, whether they've invested in something or received investment. So Gene, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I'm Gene Rickers. I'm a, I'm a 77 Penn State grad, and always happy to be back on campus. Look forward to talking to all of you. Uh, my career, I spent uh, uh, three years in public accounting after it was an account, having had an accounting degree, and after that, I sort of never looked back to accounting and spent 16 years in technology companies. I joined four startups in my life there, and all four ultimately went public, which is more a testimony probably to luck by the time you get to number four. Uh, I then spent 16 years in the venture capital business. I was involved in a number of uh, really great companies there, and also some that were not so great. Uh, and then uh, three years ago, due to a variety of uh, life experiences, I decided to leave the venture business and went back into the company life, and now with an education technology company uh, in Washington, D.C., named Everfy. Um, in terms of a particular story to tell, um, the, the company that was my single best investment as a venture capital investor was a company that you know, it was literally six people, uh, including a husband and wife and two brothers and two others working in the basement of a townhouse in Northern Virginia. And they had a terrible time articulating what they were doing, but I wound up meeting with the entrepreneur, the founder of the company, and I, because I had some unique experience in my past life that intersected with what he was trying to do, I ultimately decided to make that investment, and it produced the best returns of any investment I made, and also produced lifelong friends that I have from those people, from the people in that company. And it was a function of finding, you know, he found the right person who knew something unique that was valuable to him, which I think will be a theme of uh, this discussion today. How's it going? Uh, my name's Paul Cianciolo. Uh, I am an 07 and 09 grad from Penn State, uh, finance 07 and my MBA in 09. Uh, it's awesome to be here. It really is. Uh, I remember sitting where you're sitting not too long ago. It, it, it goes by really fast. So. Uh, it's fun to come back and uh, and uh, and be on campus again. So uh, for the last five years, uh, I've been at a, a venture capital firm called First Mark Capital. It's based in New York City. Uh, we focus on early stage investing in uh, primarily software, internet, and tech companies. Although uh, that focus is is getting more broad here recently, uh, as a lot of interesting things come uh, kind of start to happen around wearables, around hardware, and some things that that we never touched before. So, so pretty broad in terms of the things that we invest in, uh, but all early stage, so uh, mostly seed and series A types of opportunities. So we're generally putting anywhere from 
you know, 500K uh, up to a million dollars in the seed round or uh, two to five or six million dollars in the Series A investment. We tend to, to follow on and grow with our companies and, and help them develop. So, you know, our job as venture capitalists uh, is and should be to enable entrepreneurs, and you'll, you'll hear from some of my colleagues about that side of, of the experience. So it's been really interesting to, to attack entrepreneurship from the investor side. Um, and I, I'd say there's, there's a ton of lessons to be learned. And in terms of a story that I, I guess may be relevant, uh, you know, I, I think of all the things that I learned in the last five years, it's, it's that, you know, building a company is extremely hard to do. Uh, and I've never done it, and hopefully I get a chance to do it one of these days. But I've been fortunate to be around uh, hundreds or, you know, several hundreds of, on, uh, of, of entrepreneurs who, who are going through the process and are going through the process of, of building uh, companies. And uh, the one that sticks out in my mind that's still going right now, there's a, a small company called Cold Brew Labs that uh, got second place in the NYU business plan competition back in 2009 right as I was joining First Mark, and, and nobody really understood what these guys were building. Uh, they didn't even win the business plan competition, and it was a, a mobile shopping app called Tote, uh, and the idea that was that uh, uh, people were going to want to look at uh, commerce on their phones and be able to get through that experience and, and primarily focus at women. I see mostly women nodding their heads as I'm describing this, uh, which, which was intuitive for them to understand. And, uh, you know, that, that company ended up transitioning from being a mobile experience to a web-first experience and now back to mobile uh, as, as kind of the tides have turned. Uh, and that company's name now is Pinterest. Uh, so started with a handful of guys that nobody understood and, and now the company's, a, uh, you know, one of the largest social media properties on the planet. And, and, uh, and, and, and now you have a bunch of, of every, you know, a bunch of guys around the table and, and everyone knew it the whole time. But uh, I can tell you that uh, that's in fact not the case. So. Uh, things are hard, and believe in what you're doing, and, and take advice. But uh, you know, cut your own path is, is, the, is, the, is the advice there. Hi guys, my name is John. Um, sorry if my answers aren't on point. It's about 6:50 San Francisco time, <laughs> and I'm not a morning person. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, primarily around SaaS companies. Had three companies. Um, my first one just had an IPO on the NASDAQ last Friday. So last week was a really fun week. Um, my second one, I lost two million bucks. And my third one, I funded uh, largely with myself and some friends. Uh, and we're about 30 people making mobile health apps in downtown San Francisco. You know, as far as story, um, I went to Penn State and graduated in 97, and there was really nothing like IST. I and a bunch of other Penn Staters just kind of went out to San Francisco or Silicon Valley cold, you know, with the proverbial uh, maxed out credit cards and a laptop. And uh, it's a little embarrassing to say, but I did not have the highest GPA uh, at Penn State. So if I can do it, you guys can definitely do it with all the resources you have here at ISD, which is incredible. Cool. My name is Dan Veltri. Um, I'm also uh, coming out here from San Francisco. But back in 2007, I graduated from the state. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, my company is Weebly. Um, I I'd be curious if, if, if you guys would raise your hand if you've heard of Weebly. Oh, awesome. Ah. <laughs> I, guess, I guess there's a biased selection, but, but uh, yeah, so we make it surprisingly easy for entrepreneurs to uh, kind of create their online presence, and the sites that are created are, you know, optimized across all devices, and it's been a really good journey so far. Um, we're in San Francisco. Uh, we have offices in New York and a distributed support team, about 120 people. Um, network traffic-wise, we're, we're ranked about 19 on the Internet. Um, so things are going really well from the company's standpoint. Um, but, but an interesting story is kind of how, how we got started. It actually started out of an IST class. Um, <coughs> so my co-founders and I, uh, we, you know, we applied to Y Combinator, which probably some of you guys have heard of. And this is when Y Combinator was, was, was very early. We, were the, would, we ended up you know, uh, getting accepted, and we were the, the uh, first West Coast class of Y Combinator. But you know, before we got accepted, we, 
interviewed with them in Boston, and we, we actually went to the State College Enterprise uh, rent a car. Rented a car, we were on our way, and the, uh, the car alarm just starts sounding like as we're driving down you know, College Ave. And <laughs> a little bit of a rough start, so we, we go back, we switch out our car, and we're on our way. Um, and we get out to, to Boston, and we're meeting with Paul Graham. Um, and, and we had just woken up that morning, um, you know, kind of nervous about the interview. And we've been trying to get traction. We've been trying to get, you know, people to hear about us and know about us. We, I created this demo video that you know, ended, up, ended up getting posted on this, like, one small blog. But that morning when we woke up, you know, we, were, we had a, a, an article that was totally unprovoked written on TechCrunch. Um, and, and there's our demo video, and there's, like, uh, Michael Arrington at the time saying that it's one of the best website creators out there. And it was, it was um, one thing led to another. We, we went out to, to San Francisco, um, and when we were in Y Combinator, uh, there was a, a guy who was doing um, uh, kind of a piece for Newsweek. His name's Stephen Levy. He's a, he's a pretty, um, you know, pretty respected journalist, and he's also a Penn State alum. So we uh, befriended him. And... Um, and he, he liked our story, and we ended up getting in the Newsweek article as kind of the, the feature, you know, story of that piece. Um, and then, uh, you know, from there, we, we kind of continued to network, and we, we got introduced to, on our way out there, we got introduced to Matt Brezina, who's another speaker, you know, during this, uh, this week. And, and um, he ended up introducing us to our first um, investors, uh, our first angel investors, and Again, Penn State alum. So um, the, the network is strong. You know, leverage the network and uh, kind of tr try to take the most of of each opportunity. Um, you know, out there when when, when networking. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, just as a point of order, we're I'm just going to ask about talk about four different points or questions, and then we're going to leave plenty of time at the end. So you know, if you all can ask questions later, then so. Obviously, a lot of great background here, great experiences. Um, and when you start talking about show me the money, when do I go get financing, all these gentlemen can attest that timing is very, very critical in, in almost any type of transaction, whether it's be early stage financing, later stage financing, an IPO, a sale, acquisition. Timing is very, very critical. And it's not necessarily just timing about your particular business, but it's timing about the market and things like that. So the first um, question I want to ask these gentlemen is, uh, and I'll start with John, is since timing is so critical, you know, assuming you have a viable product or service, and, and, and sometimes like last night, we just saw good ideas, you know, when is, give us your insight on when is a good time to actually start thinking about investment, and then about what time should you actually start talking to people about getting investment? Right. <coughs> um, you know, I wish there was a. Well, there is a white blackboard. Anyway. Um, can I just do a quick blackboard? Sure. <laughs> so I don't mean to be pompous and use a blackboard, but I think that it'll <laughs> it'll be easier to illustrate this formula. Once you have this formula, then you know you need to go for money. Right. So I won't write all of these out, but. First, you figure out your total addressable market, right? So if it used to be that if it was one billion or more, traditional VCs would actually invest in you, um, or at least think about investing in you. Now it's trending to be more like a $2 billion market. Some of the bigger VCs, like Sequoia, would say bigger, right? Um, and then you figure out your it's called your CAC, your customer acquisition cost. And this is where a lot of young entrepreneurs make a mistake. You have this great product, you're selling it, you're hustling it in the street, people love it, they pay you 20 bucks a month. But it actually may turn out that it costs, because you have to hire salespeople, support people, you have to market it, you need to advertise. It may turn out it costs $1,500 a customer that pays you 20 bucks a month, right? So a lot of a lot of first-time entrepreneurs, I, I made this mistake myself, is you're so in love with a product, and your customers are in love with a product, but when you go to scale it, it turns out it's more expensive to get the product than people are willing to pay for it, right? Um, then you figure out your cost of goods sold, right? And then you'll figure out your margin. 
Once you have the Once you have this formula figured out, whether you're in the idea phase or you're actually selling, um, I think that's when you start looking for money. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Asian, so I had to give you a formula as an answer. How about the rest of you? Gene? Yeah. You? Uh, <laughs> I think the first way to think about raising money is don't. And, and what I mean by that is, is that so many people start with the assumption of, my first step is to write a business plan, make a little bit of progress, and then go talk to Sequoia and tell them about the $2 billion mar uh, market and go raise money. And that will absolutely apply to some of the people in this room. For many of you, the better answer is to not raise money. It's to figure out how to get to the first customer, you know, use their money to, build, to, to get your company going. And, and uh, you know, the advantage of starting a company at your age is you have, you personally, have a very low burn rate. You can, you can live on very little. And, that's a, a, an advantage of starting a company. Figure out how to, to you know, use customers' money, your, your own money, your own resources, sweat equity of you and your friends, and build a business. And, and hopefully, for some, that can lead to a stage where talking to venture capitalists about investing is, is right. I, I was in the venture capitalist business for 16 years. I raised money from VCs. I know a lot about that world, and it is a great way to raise money for certain companies. It is, but for 99% of startups, it's not the right way to raise money. So uh, you need to figure out if, if the venture capital route is the right route for you or not. And I'd say that the vast majority of people start out with the assumption that it is the right route, and the vast majority wind up not raising venture capital. So figure out how to get there without it is the best route for most. Uh, yeah, so I can add to that. I mean, I agree with, with these guys. Um, but what I would say is that um, <coughs> you, you should you know, focus on what's more than the money. Like, what can the investor bring to the table? Um, you know, in terms of advice, in terms of connections, uh, in terms of other things beyond just uh, the monetary value of the investment. Um, and overall, like, well, a good example, that's Y Combinator, right? Like, we, our first round of kind of funding was $20,000, right? It wasn't a massive amount of funding. Um, we lived off that in a three in a two bedroom apartment, the three of us for 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 months um, in San Francisco. You know that powered our personal expenses as well as our business expenses. So you got to stay scrappy. That's that's a really good point um, because you want to be showing uh, traction, right, in your product and your service and your revenue if you have it. You know you want to be showing good growth. Um, if you if you can show that, right, you're going to get a better valuation. You're going to get better investors. You're going to get more introductions. It's just going to be a way easier process. So your goal is to show traction and growth and, and, and show a great product. Um, and you really want to be able to raise money when you can paint a picture of the vision and, and the future of, of why you guys should exist and what you're going to do with that money. Um, yeah, and the last point I wanted to make is that <coughs> when you're raising money, you kind of have to, you know, you should be somewhat humble about it, but in general you got to feel and the investor should feel that you're going to be successful whether or not you raise their money. They don't want to they don't want their money to be the reason you guys are successful. They want to join a uh, you know, a company that's going in the right direction already and with or without them, you're going to be great. Um, it just makes it a much easier sell and and it's 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 uh it's a much better place to be in. Yeah, so I think you're you're going to hear a common theme from the four of us. Uh and I don't know how many of you follow the tech rags and that the tech crunch is the nationalist of the world. Uh, what I'd start out by saying is that, you know, unfortunately I think we've kind of trended towards a time where, where there's a lot of entrepreneurs uh, that think raising money is, is a victory, right? Uh, it's a win out in the market. And it can certainly be helpful to, you know, bring traffic, hype, customers, partners, all these things to your business. You know, the, the announcement of raising money and the, the act of raising money itself, but it's just really the beginning, right? So, you know, when you when you raise that money, you you take on a new set of complexity with your business, and and you have, in effect, people you have to answer to, and and more responsibilities than you had before, and a greater set of expectations than you had before. Um, and without diving too far down the rabbit hole of of you know, venture back businesses uh, versus lifestyle oriented businesses, I would say that. It's before you raise the money, understanding why you're doing it and what you're trying to accomplish and, and thinking about the goals and the outcomes that you as a team are trying to achieve is a really important thing to do. 
Uh, you know, if you're trying to change the way that people build and, and, and launch websites, uh, and you have a great product and you figure out that equation and a bunch of other indicators in the market dictate that you should raise money, I think, you know, those will point you in the right direction, but I, I would say that raising money for, for money's sake is, is never a good idea. Um, and that overcapitalization of businesses, you know, having too much money, uh, I don't know if Dan would agree with me or, or and John would agree with me, but I think that first 20K was probably made you, made you guys be scrappy. It made you think about every dollar that you put into the business and where it was going and, and uh, how it was going to make the product and the experience better. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people call it dumb money, I'll call it not smart money out in the market right now that are, are, are flooding to entrepreneurs uh, and they're hurting a lot of businesses. So I think getting that equation right and getting product right and getting all these things uh, in a good place is, is the right thing to do before you ever talk to any investors. Thanks. I, I would just add from my experience, you know, when, when you, if you ultimately get to the point where you're talking about bringing in a, a finance partner and, and you know, no offense, Gene, but they'll love to tell you that, well, this is just a minority investment. You know, you have control. The reality is, as soon as they come in, you lose control. Um, and it, it's, it's subtle, but it's there. And you just have to be aware. And if you can, you start building this story as long as you possibly can to build a better story. And once that story is strong, the business is strong, you have some clients, you have some customers, uh, when you bring in that partner, you're able to m maintain a little bit more control as opposed to bringing them in so soon uh, that the next thing you know, you as the entrepreneur, the founder, and the CEO, you're sitting in the back corner while somebody else is driving you know, your beautiful Ferrari. So, yeah, right. the, the other thing I'll add to that is in five years, the companies that have gotten the best valuations and uh, are, you know, are, have been able to optimize that process the best are the companies that don't need to raise money, frankly. Uh, when you turn the kind of supply demand curves on the investors' heads uh, and, and you force them to come to you and, and, and make it, you know, give yourself own your, your own leverage in that process, it, it's the best thing that you could do for yourself as an entrepreneur. So put yourself in a position where you don't need to raise capital is the advice. Okay, so moving on. Um, you've made the decision, the timing's right. Uh, now, you, now you embark on a search for uh, organizations that have capital that you m might think you want to talk to. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a strong fascination with Silicon Valley and everybody moving out west. Uh, in but New York. In New York. I was going to get to New York. <laughs> uh, but there are pockets, particularly as it relates to IST and, and things like that, where uh, there's a tremendous amount of capital and organizations willing to invest uh, in Silicon Valley, in Boston, New York City, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Austin. So you have this a pretty big universe of, of sources of capital. Uh, and these sources all come in different sizes, shapes. Uh, they have different biases, different beliefs, different funding strategies. So what I want to ask the panel is, how do you sift through all that, that minefield of trying to identify the right type of organization that you would want to partner up with because it is very important about that your goals align with their goals. Gene, I'll start with you since sure. you have a lot of experience in this. Well, <coughs> first of all, uh, my comments, I'm going to try to generalize to angel investors and venture capitalists. They are obviously different creatures and they think differently, but a lot of the lessons apply across the two groups. Um, the, the single most important theme that I touched on in the introduction is, is you know, you got to do your homework. You got to find people who are aligned with you. Yeah, one of the the, the easy example of a lack of alignment is you know, I, I, in my venture capital life. I only invested in information technology businesses. Every now and then, I meet somebody who says, "I know you only do IT companies. Let me tell you about my biotech deal. This is the one you want to do." The answer is no. I can't. I mean, legally, I couldn't. I had a contract with our investors that said. We invest in these things and we don't invest in these. You know, don't waste my time, don't waste your time. But it, <clears throat> it's much more subtle than that. It's understanding where they invest, the size of the investment, the, the, the stage they invest it at. If you go to, you know, New Enterprise Associates, which is the largest venture firm in the world and a great firm, uh, and ask them to make a $50,000 investment. They, they can't do that. They don't know how to think that way. They can make relatively small investments, but they can't do $50,000. Uh, 
They have billions and billions of dollars to manage. The flip side is you go to some angel investor and say, I want you to invest five million. That person maybe can do 50,000, but they can't do, they can't do five million. So you need to understand the size. You need to understand their target markets, as I talked about before. But you also need to understand it geographically. I, there's a lot of excellent firms in Silicon Valley who do not invest on the East Coast. There's some that do. So don't work with the assumption, well, I'll, I'll convince them of doing their first East Coast deal. You won't. It's, you're wasting your time. You know, my joke with my friends out there is that, that they'll invest in anything they can get to on half a tank of gas in a Ferrari. So can't get here. Um, and so, you know, do your homework. And, and then there, there's nuances beyond that, such as are they early or late in their fund life? If you're like going to be the last investment in a fund, you might not get the deal done. If you're going to be one of the early investments, that may be is easier. Is the partner that you're working with or that you're talking to, are they, do they have some clout in the firm? Or is this going to be their first deal? Or maybe they, you know, if they just had an IPO, they're, they're the golden child in the firm. If they just had two companies fail, they might, not, they might have trouble getting any deal through their partnership. You can do a lot of homework. You know, frankly, a lot of this you can just find on Google uh, and their own website. And frankly, you can find out a lot about angels in a similar way. They may not have a website, but you can track it down. So I, I actually don't have much to add to that. I think that's a fantastic answer. Um, I, I would just say there are plenty of public sources available uh, with most of this information, right? Uh, time is, is your most precious commodity as a startup, right? Whether you're funded or unfunded. And I think you have to attack capital raising just like you'd attack the market with your product, right? I think you have to be, you know, uh, very, very focused on figuring out quickly who are the right people uh, that could help your business. Uh, limit that universe. I mean, you want to have as few, conversation as po few conversations as possible within reason. Uh, you certainly want to have a, a big enough universe that, you know, you're going to get some no's before you get that yes, probably. And, you know, I, I would just say uh, it's really, really important uh, to find, you know, when, when you limit that universe and you have that list of folks, you know, how you reach those folks is, is as important as, you know, that list itself. Um, and sometimes you're not going to have that network to be able to access people, even if you know that there's five investors out there that would be perfect for your business, right? Uh, the tools exist today. You know, I think LinkedIn is one of the most powerful things, you know, on the web right now. And the reason is, from a professional sense, you can reach almost anybody, uh, even if you're in college, especially if you're in college right now, you know? There's not too many investors and there's not too many entrepreneurs that won't respond to an email from a relevant student with a relevant question about a relevant topic to them. Uh, keyword being relevant, right? So when you're attacking uh, the capital raising process, relevancy and context is really important and making sure that you're reaching out to the people, you're managing your time wisely and you're, and you're doing it in a really smart way. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I remember Drew Houston of uh, Dropbox telling me uh, he did 49 VC pitches and got rejected 49 times. And one of them actually said, storage is everywhere. It's been done for years. Are you stupid? Um, so I, I think when you're looking for money, you know, uh, be persistent. I, I do disagree a little bit. Um, I think the Bay Area right now is the best place to go to raise money. Um, especially if you're looking, well, all kinds of money. Um, right now in the Bay Area, for better or for worse, it seems like anyone with a net worth of a million dollars or more fancies himself an angel investor. And so uh, literally the, the guy that pulls up to the Starbucks in uh, Aston Martin, he's an angel investor, yeah, right? Um, the sources of money in the Bay Area right now are it's s seemingly up unlimited um, and what I've seen fundraising I you know in, in my three companies uh, they've raised over 80 million dollars um, pitched in Boston New York Texas I, I don't know why this is and it, it sounds like I'm biased because I'm a, a San Franciscan but uh, Bay Area people just make up their minds faster they write a check faster um, and there's just more of them so I sorry I you know, just one man's opinion <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Bay Area, 
um, is strong, and, 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 and New York as well. Those are the two main centers. Austin's strong, too, but I haven't had experience in those areas. Um, I, I will add to what, what these guys have said. In, in terms of, like, the, the outcome um, of your business, you want to make sure that what your expectation of the outcome is aligns with the investor's expectations because, you know, VCs are going to have, uh, they're going to need a bigger return, um, uh, you know, to pay off uh, that fund, right? And they want that 10x. Um, you know, angel investors um, are going to have a little bit lower bar. And, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense necessarily when you're very early to go for VC, right? You can leverage your network. Um, Bay Area is a great place to do that. There, is, there are a lot of sources of capital. Um, there are angel investors that are very happy to put in um, $25,000, $50,000, and they'll do so fast because there's, there's um, this concept right now. Um, it's pretty, it, it's kind of come into uh, being in the last, like, you know, five years. It wasn't really the case when, when we were uh, first raising money, but it's called a convertible note, and that's, that's something that allows uh, an investor to, to um, provide money to, to your company and uh, convert it convert that uh, money into equity when a financing occurs at a later stage. And, and basically, it's kind of like they're making a loan to your company. Um, and the paperwork for that is, is super easy. It's like a couple pages. And there's, there's convertible note documentation online from Y Combinator that is completely standard. And, you could, and it's very common to use. So you could literally like, take that exact convertible note, plug in your own information, um, and, and angel investors are, are comfortable raising money or, or providing money to your company with something like that um, if they believe in you, right? And that is like very low cost and, and, and very low dilution because you don't actually get diluted until you raise equity. So that, that's, that's an interesting source. Um, I, I, I've not had experience with this, but you know, th there are uh, many examples of companies um, or just kind of ideas that get funding from Kickstarter. So if you can present your your idea, your product in the right way to the right people online through Kickstarter or similar channels, like that's a super great way to start, um, you know, that, that, that whole process. And there's, um, I'm sure you guys maybe saw the news of like that company Oculus uh, with the virtual reality glasses. They started on Kickstarter and they just sold to Facebook for a couple billion. Um, so uh, the, the, and then one more thing I wanted to say on the, on the outcome stage, like you want to make sure that you're aligned and, you know, the paperwork, uh, like the, the, t the terms of the deal um, can be modified in terms of angel investments and stuff. So, for example, like when we raised our, our funding, uh, our initial angel funding, right, from, um, from Steve Anderson and, and Ron Conway, uh, Th th there was th investors have a right to kind of deny a sale, right? If the, if it doesn't kind of meet the criteria that th that they want to see, right? So, what we did is we kind of modified that term and said, you know, you can deny you can deny the sale if it's below 15 million, but if it's above 15 million dollar sale, we have full rights to to sell, right? Because and we were we were all aligned on that because that was a big outcome, you know, for us at the time, and so um, you just got to make sure you're aligned with with their incentives and the outcome that that you're pursuing is aligned that way you're you're just very transparent about it and everyone's on the same page along the way so I, I just before we move on to the next question which is really about okay how do you pitch how do you present what are and the, these folks can give you some some great advice and i just want to add to john's point when you go into these situations and you're actually pitching people uh, it, it is psychological warfare uh, these folks will hit you uh, with everything you can imagine and you know being rejected is not necessarily a bad thing um, I had the opportunity to pitch to about 30 different investors now I was doing later stage investment but the interesting thing on the first 15 the first 33 percent of those investors looked at me like I don't get your business would never invest in it now we had done our research and the profile fit we even had an investment banker saying you should talk to these folks um, and they, you know, looked at me and said I was unfocused and you got all this negative feedback, but the reality is you just have to take it. Um, the next, you know, 33%, they were like, yeah, I kind of get it. Looks like a good idea. And then there was another third. It was like, love it. Absolutely love it. Um, but you have to be, you have to go into it knowing that you're going to get beat up. 
and it's not necessarily an indictment on your business. It may be just their philosophies don't align. So, uh, but you know, preparing for that is you, know, you creating the pitch is one thing, but psychologically, you have to put yourself in a frame of mind where it's going to be tough, and they're going to hit you with a lot of different things. So. Moving on to the next question is, how do you prepare for that? When you're getting ready to go talk to investors, you know, what are some tips and advice, uh, horror stories that you've seen, things that, you know, have just gone, you know, awry or things like that. So I want to sh share the good and the bad and the ugly on all those different things. And, and Dan, we'll, I'm going to start with you on this one and we'll let the other ones. Yeah, awesome. So, you know, when you're pitching an investor, they probably don't have any idea what you do yet, right? So. You, you have to deliver that message as clearly and succinctly as possible. And you're trying to sell them basically on four main things. Um, one is that you're the right team to do this, right? They got to believe in you kind of is the number one thing. A lot of investors will say they invest in the entrepreneur, less so the idea. Um, that's kind of a philosophy of Y Combinator and others. Um, I remember Steve Anderson saying that he invested in um, Kevin uh, Sis from, from Instagram. Uh, but they didn't, th he believed in, in Kevin, right, and his team. Um, not necessarily, Instagram didn't exist at the time. They pivoted to that. So, so you got to make sure that they believe in your team. Um, you know, to, uh, to this point, you got to make sure that your, your market, um, you know, is they can see the size of that. You can address the size. You can, you can make sure that um, there's a lot of opportunity on that front, and you can sell that. Um, <coughs> also, you know, the product itself, you, you really want to deliver, uh, let, them, let them see and demo, ideally, uh, a really, really well done, you know, kind of uh, intuitive, depends what you're building, right? But you want it to be kind of a, a, a very solid product at that time. Um, and, uh, and then you want to paint the picture, picture of the vision. And you want to do that as cl clearly and succinctly as possible. Um, I think that's the basis of a good pitch, and, and it's an open dialogue, right? You, you're going to see it in their eyes if they're kind of excited and they're going to lean in. Um, to, to these guys' points, we've had plenty of rejections. Um, a lot of, like, a couple of investors said, why, why, why would somebody need a website when they could create a MySpace profile? Like, <laughs> uh, at the time, that was a relevant question, but uh, not everyone's going to see that vision. Not everyone's going to believe in the team. but. Um, it's it's really about getting getting out there, leveraging that network, like I said, um, and uh, really hitting on those key points. Um, <coughs> so the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, I'll start with the ugly, and excuse me because I'm gonna, I'm gonna curse. Uh, <coughs> my first pitch to a real VC was uh, with Greylock Greylock Partners in Boston. And uh, I showed up with this ridiculous shirt that I had made with my company logo. And on the back, it said, like, some variation of, like, buy now, exclamation, exclamation. Um, and in the middle of slide two, one of the partners said, kid, kid, cut the fucking hype. <laughs> I, um, and, you know, from there, I, this is where I, uh, I came up with this formula. Because it's easier to talk math than to be a, 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 you don't think you're a used car salesman, but when you're an investor and you've had five pitches that day, 25 emails a day of people pitching you, um, it's hard not to come across as a used car salesman. So talking math is a lot easier, right? Uh, and it just comes across as more logical than, than emotional. So that was the ugly. The bad, you know, um, uh, at my current company, Doctor Base, we were uh, pitching to different uh, forms of uh, types of investors, and I actually had an investor say, "Why would a patient want to email their doctor? They could just go into the office." <laughs> so not everyone's going to get it, you know. Even though you want to hit them with the obvious stick, right? Um, uh, and I think the good is, um, you know. And I, and I definitely suggest this as an alternative if you guys are getting trash and are getting customers. Um, in my third startup, we were lucky enough to have customers that have money, doctors. I mean, they're not uber rich, but they have money. Um, so we asked them if they wanted to be investors. They knew our product. They knew us. We had a relationship with them. And uh, it, was a, it was a relatively easy way to raise a million bucks. 
um, from people that already trusted you. So, here's what I'll say. I, after seeing thousands of pitches, and, and it's true, like venture capitalists and professional investors get into this, this kind of mindset where we're looking for reasons to self-select out of a process, right? Uh, I mean, I have to find a way to prioritize my and our time as a firm to, to get to know as fast as we can because uh, flow, ha inbound flow of, of opportunities happens to be at a really good point, right? We've made some good investments and we've gotten to work with some fantastic entrepreneurs and as a result, uh, a lot of people find us, which is great. Uh, what's bad about that is, is we can only look at so many things, right? So we have to find a way uh, to get to know as quickly as possible. And that, that's true for a first meeting, and that's true for an, you know, a partner level pitch, which is with our entire firm, uh, which is a really big deal. And you know, what I'll say is, you know, once you're there, um, there's so much great content out there that people have put, to, you know, put, to put on the web about how to put a good pitch deck together. Um, in the session later today, I'll go through some of that, but um, so I'm not gonna spend the time here, because uh, a lot of what Dan said is absolutely true, and those are, how venture capitalists think about risk. They assess risk in those different buckets that he talked about. You know, what I'll say is, is the very best pitches that I've seen uh, are the ones that are, are not complicated, right? The, the act of raising money, if you've done your work, is it can be relatively easy, relatively being the key word. Uh, and, and the process can be arduous, yeah. but the, you know, the pitch and in, in getting to a, an initial yes doesn't have to be uh, incredibly difficult. And kind of the way I think about it, the very best, pi best, best pitches that I've seen, you know, kind of merge, you know, one is the story and the vision, right? Am I sitting there and do I believe in the, con in the team and the confidence that they exude to go out and execute on this opportunity, assuming that we could both be aligned and, and going after that? And can they show me that based on that story and based on that vision, they've done some things out in the market, and this goes to traction and metrics, that prove that they're good, you know, execution-wise? Uh, can I get behind those two ideas? Do I believe in you as a team? Do I believe in the vision? And do I believe that you've demonstrated enough to actually go and execute on that in a big, big way? Uh, and that's, it's really can be as simple as that. Now there's, there's I'm over, oversimplifying it of course, but if I can't get behind the story and feel the confidence from the entrepreneurs, like we, we never get there. So uh, I think merging those two things uh, really results in confidence from the investor's perspective and it'll get you a long way, so. Yeah, I want to add to the point about VCs are actually thinking about how do I get to a no and then bring this process to an end. And, and so you've got to give them reasons to, you got to make it that, that, that they won't get there. The first thing to do, I think, is right up front have one slide that says what you are. I, I saw hundreds or thousands of presentations that describe sort of a general issue, a market need, it should be solved this way, here's how we can do it. And what happens is the audience is sitting there, they're not really sure what you are, so they reach a conclusion. Then you present what you are, and if it doesn't line up with their conclusions, like, well, these guys are wrong. Um, it's completely unfair, but don't let them get, get in that box. Tell them in you know, one slide, you know, we build X for Y market for a Z need. And that way you framed it. Now I'm gonna tell you about the market, now I'm gonna tell you about the need, now I'm gonna tell you about our experiences. So don't let them start trying to figure that out on their own. And most presentations I saw that were really good did one slide, maybe two like that, and then they went from sort of the general to the specific. You can also go from the specific to the general. But, you know, your company, your, your solution, and, and here's how it applies, and here's the market size, and so on. But don't let the audience try to figure out what the heck you are, because they'll get frustrated, and then when you tell them what you are, they'll decide what, that guy's clearly wrong. Um, so, I had, early on in my VC career, I met with a guy who was a very successful partner on the West Coast and in another firm, and he said, he said here's, here's what you're wrestling with. He said, you're gonna do something less than 1% of the deals you ever see. And what you're doing is you're getting to, there's 90% of the deals you see, you instantly say no to, and 2% of the deals you say, see, those are really exciting, and how can I, I gotta dig into these and figure out which ones I wanna invest in. And there's 8% in between that you're not sure about. He said, your life gets so much better if you can turn that 90% instant nose into like 96% instant nose, because you don't waste time on those 6% in between. So what, what Paul's saying is for real. They're trying to get to a no. So 
you, you've got to find people who are, at that moment, open-minded and smart about your category, so they'll listen to this and they'll think, and they will help you think through it. They'll ask really good questions. You know, pay attention to those questions. Okay. Um, so, last question before we turn it over to the audience to ask questions is, uh, and this is something that, uh, as a young entrepreneur, I got great advice from two entrepreneurs who, who were extremely successful, and they said, you're going to make mistakes, and it's going to cost you money. Uh, and then my business partner, his dad's a, a union um, carpenter from Jersey, and uh, uh, I think he had maybe an eighth grade education. But his words of wisdom says, boys, you're going to have to pay to learn. So we've always kind of espoused to that as, as we've built our companies. You have to pay to learn. Um, you pay when you're a kid. You climb a tree. Your parents tell you not to. You break your arm. You just learned, hopefully. You're paying for a great education here at Penn State. You're paying to learn. It's no different in business. You're going to make mistakes, and you're going to pay. Um, the trick is not paying too much and not, not making those mistakes. Um, but going through this process, again, it's about meeting with investors, learning that process, learning, getting that feedback. Um, and you're going to make mistakes. Uh, so I want to ask the panel, you know, wrap this up with questions like, Oh, let's give these folks ideas of what not to do. We've talked a lot about things you should do, but what are, the, what are some key things that you absolutely should not do, could absolutely kill it from the very beginning? Uh, Paul, we'll start with you since you're in the process of seeing a lot of pitches right now. Sure. Uh, wow, the, the list of what not to do. Uh, <laughs> Maybe just the major ones. Yeah, just the major <laughs> ones. Um, <laughs> just this stuff is really hard. I mean, I, it's easy for us to sit here and talk about it, right? Uh, especially, you know, us that never built a business yet, different from these guys that have, uh, and I may be unique that way. Um, but we occupy a, an interesting vantage point in the market where we get to see a lot of failure. We get to see a lot of what not to do. And I wish that I had thought of this, and I wish that I had said it a couple of years ago when I heard it, and, and I could claim it as my own, but. Uh, but I didn't, so I won't. But it's really, really good advice, and it's given me a framework to think about uh, about early stage businesses as an investor, as well uh, as as you know when and when and if I get the opportunity to be an entrepreneur and build a business. Um, and it was by an entrepreneur at a at a company called uh, Widget Box. I think is now Flight. It's a it's a West Coast based company uh, in the ad tech market. And he was in speaking to a, an entrepreneurship class at NYU, and and I was there. Uh, and he said that, um, how many finance majors do we have in, in the room? Any? Not a single one? <laughs> <laughs> Two. Uh, there you go. What were we thinking, right? Uh, I should have done IST. I was telling Marilyn, where's Marilyn sitting in here somewhere? I was telling her before the program. I sat, I sat in CompSci 203. Uh, is Deborah Bernstein still here? You, anybody you know, know her? I sat in that class in 2006, maybe, thinking, wow. None of this is relevant to me. Computers, technology, this is, I'm never going to need this. Bad call. Uh, so you're in the right room. Uh, but I'm sitting at NYU and I'm listening to, uh, to Will speak. And he's talking about early stage businesses. And he's talking about risk. Um, and, 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 and the risk of going to a corporation or starting a business. And how people used to think the safe thing was going to a corporation where you, you know, you'd have a steady salary. Uh, and this is right before, uh, you know, right around the downturn where people were getting laid off from you know, the Goldman Sachs of the world, which was the kind of the golden ticket. Um, and, and he had chosen the entrepreneurial route, and he viewed it as safer to bet on himself and, and his own ability to go out and execute on a market. And, and he talked about, uh, and I asked the question about how many finance majors we have, um, and anybody know how an option is valued? Anybody know what an option is? <laughs> okay. So, so an option is derivative in the financial market, it, and, and the way it's valued is, is based on two factors. One is volatility, how you know, much things move up and down, and the other is on duration, which is the, the, the length of time that you can look at that instrument, right? And as an entrepreneur, I thought this was, was really, really interesting. You can't control volatility a lot of the times. You, know, you, you can't control what new technologies are in the market. You can't control what your competitors are doing. You can't control a lot of things. Uh, but what you can control is duration, right? And I come back to the guys at Pinterest, Cold Brew Labs at the time, and they had raised a small seed round from us, and, and they honestly had gone through a couple of different products, uh, and, and they were finding their way through the market, and, and 
you know, even, even we didn't completely understand where they were headed. But they had a vision, and what they did was really interesting. They had, they had a couple hundred thousand dollars, uh, and, and, and therefore they had a certain amount of time and runway to go build their business. And no one was going to write another check if they didn't have and show some success. They couldn't control you know, how the market was accepting their product necessarily. They could try a bunch of things, but what they control is the time frame in which they could try different things. So they took burn down very, very low. And they extended their runway a long, long time. And they were able to try many more things than a lot of businesses can out there. Uh, and I thought that was just an incredible, incredible lesson that I learned very early in my career and that the best entrepreneurs seem to know intuitively or, or learn from other people that they work with is that, again, time is the most precious commodity that you have. And you're going to make mistakes. But giving yourself enough runway to make as many mistakes as possible is the key to this whole game. So I'll pass it along. I just want to talk briefly about mistakes I see in the presentations, uh, really common ones. You know, one is, I have no competitors. And, and what you're really saying is no, there's nobody exactly like me. That's a very different concept. If that problem really exists in the market, people are trying to solve it in some other way. Your competitor is that alternative solution to that problem or an alternative use for those budget dollars. So to say you have no competitors, I, I, I'd be astonished if it's, if it's an accurate statement. Um, another one is, is that people build, in, in the early days, you build a financial model and inevitably you wind up with a profit margin that is relative to historical norms absurd, absurdly high. Um, and there's two ways to go about this. Uh, the, there's three ways to go about this. One is to really understand at a very early stage what your long-term business financial model is going to look like. It's actually really hard. You probably can't figure it out. Um, you can look at metrics, you can look at comparisons to other similar businesses like the SaaS businesses and see how they've grown, but m and maybe you can find some models there. But there, there, if you present something, I'm, I'm going through this with, I'm coaching a friend who's raising money in a very different market than I'm used to, but a lot of the rules are the same. And I said, you, you know, these, these profit margins aren't believable. And there's two answers. The first is to defend them. No, 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 we're going to produce 70% pre-tax margins. You'll get thrown out of the room. It just won't happen. Those kind of margins attract competitors, and you will, people will come into your market and take your money. Um, the second one is to say, you know, I know that's not right, but I don't know how it's wrong. And I need a financial partner who's going to help me with this. And that, to me, is a completely reasonable answer. It's OK to say there's stuff I don't know yet about my business. And I want people to work with me and help me figure it out. And you know, will customer support costs be higher? Will per, per unit sales costs be higher? Do I have? not enough engineering costs for product number two. Yeah, you know, that could all be true. And, and that to me is a co completely reasonable answer as an early stage investor. If I'm a later stage investor, it's a completely unreasonable answer. I, you should have solved it by the time you got to a later stage investor. So there's a couple places where I see people mista make mistakes. Um, I'll just go with the top three things you shouldn't say, because uh, it's said so often, and I think, I don't know if Gene, Paul, you agree, but they're just immediate no's. One is, if we could only get 1% of a billion dollar market, I can't tell you how many times I hear that. Um, it's just a no. You know, don't ever say that. Uh, two is, we have the black box solution, or we have the secret algorithm, or we have whatever. You know, That's a variation of that. Um, the world, the valley, is filled with hyper smart people. Um, your colleagues in this classroom, a lot of you guys are hyper smart people. Um, there is no black box solution. Uh, there really isn't. Even the Google algorithm, uh, you could read that patent and it's pretty clear. It's based on backlinks. Uh, the third thing is, uh, and I think this is kind of the trickiest, uh, trickiest thing to avoid saying, but it's to say, we have cheap operating costs. Um, my first startup, our A round was $5 million. It lasted about 13 months. We all bought Aeron chairs for everyone. Um, we spent $30,000, $80,000 on a logo. Um, you're you're going to spend the money. So if part of your business plan is that you're going to eat ramen every day, um, in San Francisco, where a one-bedroom apartment right now costs $2,500 a month, and that's a pretty crappy apartment. Um, 
you're not seeing eye to eye with your investor who wants to give you this money and, and knows that, you know, wants to know that you're going to spend it wisely, right? Um, so, one 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 thing that's slightly off topic from from the funding, but one thing to really pay attention to is who you're kind of partnering up with as a co-founder because. Um, it's a life, it's not lifelong, but it's like a very, uh, the commitment, like the future of the company, right, um, depends a lot on your relationship with that person. And I like to equate it to like, uh, like, like, like kind of like a marriage. Like you're going to be living with this person. You're going to be making decisions together. You're going to make sure that you need to make sure that you're compatible with this, with the, 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 this person or the team that you're, you're partnering up with. So that's, you can phrase it as don't, like what not to do, don't partner with a, uh, just a bat, like a person you don't really align with. But on the funding topic, I, I think there's kind of like two phases of a company. There's like the company when before you have product market fit and the company after that. And product market fit means that you've developed, uh, you know, a, a product or a solution that um, really resonates with customers and can grow organically and spreads by word of mouth and kind of the metrics work and, and things are on the right track and up and to the right. There's this you know, phase of the company in the beginning when you're trying to figure things out and you don't know, you know, you're really refining the experience and you don't know, um, you don't know what works, right? And, and your goal is to get to that product market fit. But it's really important to think about that in, with respect to what Paul said about the duration because you need to, whatever the source of capital it is, um, you, need to, you need to make sure that you can make it to that next stage. And you're going to have a really tough time raising money or growing organically before you have that product market fit. So the source of capital might be your own bank account, or it might be that Y Combinator money, the $20,000 we raised initially. But we were able to take our angel funding, right, and it was 650k, um, and we, you know, raised that in the beginning of 2008. Uh, that lasted us through the almost two years. Um, and this was this was at a, a bad time in terms of the economy, and our bank account went from 650k, and basically nearly nearly hit zero. But we were able to get that product market fit right, and we were very frugal um, overall during that phase of the company before we had it. And then we kind of you know kind of cracked the nut, if you will, on on um, how to how to make money from our customer base, and we had a, a good product that people came back to and used, and it kind of spread, um, you know, more naturally. And so, kind of before you have that product market fit, d don't be spending anything on anything excessive, you know, um, because that money is so valuable, and the money is very r directly related to the duration and the amount of time that you're going to last. And if, you, if you're trying to raise money, like they said earlier, without that... Um, like if you're desperate for it, you're going to have a really tough time or you're not going to be able to make it happen. Um, after you have product market fit and you have money, use that to really expand more aggressively. Because you can, you can have that same philosophy, right, of being frugal and, and kind of not really thinking of moving that like super fast to expand. But if you have that product market fit and you believe in that product and the vision, then go, go make it big because otherwise competitors will kind of creep um, and, and kind of crowd your market and... Um, it's just it's just the time to spend. So it's kind of two phases. I would think about it like that. Anything else to add? No. Uh, I'll just chime in with uh, another thought. that's building off of several themes here. The point about having the right co-founder is really important. Also about having the right investors. You need to check out the investors and check out their behavior. And this is stuff you probably cannot find on, on a Google search. Uh, you need to find not just successful companies they've been invested in, but unsuccessful ones. How did that partner deal with the stress of a business failure? You know, how, did they react well? You know, I used to give references of, from CEOs that I had fired to invest, to potential, uh, to companies we might invest in. And it's no fun firing a founder. That's a horrible experience for everybody. Uh, but that person wasn't going to leave the company where it needed to go. But I treated those people with a level of respect that they deserved, and they could still be a reference for me under very difficult circumstances. So you need to understand how those people deal with challenges. You know, I, you, What you need is a business partner who's going to help guide you and give you good advice. You don't need a business partner who comes in and says, 
hey, I looked at the last quarter results and revenue was down. What happened? That's useless. I know revenue was down. Um, you know, what you need is somebody who says, okay, let's, let's diagnose why revenue was down or below plan and what we're going to do about it. And here's three ideas and here's three people you should talk to. That's what you need. And there's a, every investor will tell you they're a value add. Probably two-thirds of them are incorrect. Uh, and some portion of those two-thirds actually are the opposite. They actually do harm. Um, so, but, you know, wherever you live with a, any group of investors, you should have a network where you can figure this out. Find somebody who's worked with that person in the past and get real feedback. If I can just add to that, um, there's a website called The Funded, thefunded.com. And uh, it's like the Yelp of investors. You can actually read what guys like us are saying about our former VCs. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> the, the, funded, you know, the Funded is like Yelp. There's stuff on there that isn't accurate too, but it's a, it's a great source. Okay. Well, you can tell these gentlemen are very good at giving pitches and hearing pitches because we've allotted about 10 minutes for questions and answers from you, and we actually have three extra minutes, so you can tell they're very succinct and good at that. So now we're going to turn it over to you. Hopefully you have some questions for these gentlemen. Yes? I didn't see a hand raised, so. Okay. Um, obviously, the world of incubators and accelerators are growing and growing and growing uh, a lot more quickly um, and exponentially. Are you finding that more firms are investing in startups that are coming out of incubators and accelerators more than, than before? Okay. To I, I can did everybody that. hear that? Uh, it's pretty relevant to, to, to our situation because um, we were part of Y Combinator, which is kind of probably the largest kind of incubator accelerator. I, I don't have experience talking about others, but um, what I will say is that when we were, you know, coming up in Y Combinator, um, there was there's this thing at the end of it called Demo Day where you pitch, right, and the companies in Y Combinator pitch to um, a whole room full of investors. And that size of that room has grown uh, exponentially over the years. And now they have to have this huge auditorium in like the computer science museum or something to just house all the investors that want to invest in these Y Combinator companies. Um, the level of interest and kind of the funding environment for uh, the companies that are coming out of an incubator um, like Y Combinator is, is huge and it's a huge stamp of approval. Um, and uh, and uh, it's just, it's, it's night and day um, compared to not being in, a, in an incubator, I would imagine. So it's, it's interesting. I have like very mixed feelings about incubators. Uh, I hate demo days. I hate going to demo days. And the reason is all of the presentations are extremely polished. Everyone sounds good. I mean, they, they coach the companies to a T, right? So everyone sounds like they're on their way to the next billion dollar exit, honestly. Uh, and when you dig in, you're going to find the problems that are inherent in any business. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's, it's why, so to answer your question, we, we have invested in companies out of some of the incubators. We have two Techstars New York companies uh, in the portfolio. We've never done a Y Combinator company, but there's no particular reason why. There's Dreamit, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a ton of great incubators. Blueprint Health, which is more of healthcare, there's Rock Health out on the West Coast. Uh, so you're seeing these incubators kind of uh, take more of a verticalized approach in a lot of ways, and there's the general guys that build scale over the years. Um, you know, so they certainly can be a really great vetting mechanism for companies. So, like, getting in is tough. Staying in and keeping on product is tough. And, and kind of producing a, a good path out of the accelerator can be a great vetting mechanism. Where it hurts us is typically on pricing. Uh, you know, coming out of, of Demo Day, and which is only a several month process, you know, companies, I've seen them increase their value on paper, you know, tenfold. Uh, and people are throwing around, you know, caps of 15 on a company that hasn't launched yet. Uh, so, so without going too far down the rabbit hole on that subject, I think I think they can be really good, and I think they're awesome for entrepreneurs who, who go and they focus really, really hard for a handful of months to prove uh, a product or a market or, or an opportunity that they're going after. Um, as an investor, I think it's great. I mean, typically we're making more Series A than C investments anyway. Um, so the more great companies out there. I'm happy with that. Pricing gets a little difficult and the market gets a little frothy, but 
um, in general, I think it's I think it's a good thing to to uh, empower entrepreneurs with with better programming and better people. And uh, I think the incubators actually and the accelerators have about the best business model, you know, out there. They get a bunch of guys like us, all of us at this table, to go and donate our time for free, so that I can three months later pay 10x the price <laughs> after helping them for free. So, Paul, Paul Graham is maybe the most brilliant person in the history of entrepreneurial history. So. Anybody else? Well, I, I should also mention that uh, Paul Graham doesn't like to wear pants. So it's, it's in all likelihood he will show up to your meeting in shorts. It's, yeah, brilliant guy. Lee? Any other students? Students, can't ask questions, you can't be an entrepreneur. Let's go. <laughs> yes. Um, so this may be ambiguous, but I'm going to ask it anyways. From start to finish, I guess, from start, finish being when you feel like you actually have a product that you can start, like you're saying, bring two investors or put out to the market. If you're kind of working on something, I guess, web-related without a lot of capital, without a lot of um, labor or anything like that, well, that's not true, labor, well, not yet, just not, not a lot of capital, about like how much time do you see that like averaging? Just what's the final point from when to from start to when? From start to just being able to put something into the market or having something that you're saying like is, is a finished product that you could bring to an investor. So just to repeat the question, uh, he's asking how long from start to finish to get a product to be able to present. So, so uh, yeah, one of the biggest misconceptions is that you should have kind of a final product to launch. Um, and that the, the, the number one thing to do is, is get it in the hands of, of customers or, or potential users because you're going to learn so much. And so a lot, of, a lot of people will try to get things like perfect uh, before getting it out there. And it might take them like a year or two. There was, well, I've, no, I've, I've known companies that have actually not launched the real product for like five years. Meanwhile, we built an entire business like, and I couldn't believe that we were at the same point at one point. Um, and uh, yeah, the sooner you get it out there, the more feedback you're going to get. And it might just be a private beta or a beta among friends or, or just whatever. But the sooner you get that product out there, you're going to be able to iterate and improve. And you can pitch it at any point when you feel comfortable with, with what you're presenting. Um, I don't think you should view it as kind of final or not final. The, bu the business is never final. So totally agree with that. I think that what I'd add is, is context is really important, right? So I know companies that literally some of our companies in our portfolio we, we, we invested in four years ago they still have the beta stamp next to their logo right and and that's not because they forgot to take it off that's that's because right, in some you. ways they can go back to those customers and they set expectations that this is going to get better but this is where we're at today it's about putting people you know in early adopter program or you know talk this, this applies to investors too right so so when someone reaches out to me and they set the proper context for hey we're on the path to where we want to be with this product we're not where we want it to be yet but we'd like your feedback you can do the same thing with customers that you can do with investors right assuming you set those expectations I mean the answer to your question is and, and these guys who have built things may or may not agree but products in this world aren't really ever done you're always improving upon it and it's always going to change iterate as the market changes um, so I totally agree about getting it out there sooner rather than later. Now, it gets more difficult when we're talking consumer versus enterprise or, or different areas of B2B. Uh, for consumer-facing applications, it's much easier to get it out there in a, in a, in a you know, small group of people and get feedback faster. It's diff more difficult if you're selling to JP Morgan, right? Uh, it's a totally different way to approach the business. It's a tough question uh, to answer. Gene? Any other comments on that one? Um, Aaron Patzer of Mint.com has a good deck, 15-slide deck on SlideShare. So if you want to look at an example of a presentation um, before he launched his product or it was fully flushed out, um, SlideShare, Mint.com. One more thing, just on the enterprise or the big business thing. Um, I don't really have the full story, but I know Sam Altman, who's the new kind of leader of Y Combinator, his previous company was looped. It was uh, way, way ahead of its time, and it was really innovative as a way to kind of have your location of where you are on your cell phone shared with your friends. 
Um, and he was trying to partner with like Sprint and Boost Mobile and uh, Verizon, all the big, you know, telco companies. And uh, he, y you got to act way bigger than you are, right? Like, like he might have been like, like working out of his apartment and, and had a team of like three, but he, he made it sound and seem like he was way bigger than that. And they wanted us kind of a, I remember, I can't remember the specific story, but he wanted a, sorry, the partner wanted a, um, a version of this built for their needs. And he's like, yeah, we can build it for you, no problem. Um, and like that we can hack, like completely hacked, hacked it together and, and, and went in there and just killed it. So act kind of bigger than you are, more confident than you are when you're trying to partner with these bigger companies and don't be afraid to like allow, <coughs> you know, maybe, maybe position it as a pilot, right? So something that's low risk for them and low risk for you. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, we have a question from Orlando, and it says, how has running a successful business been different from what you thought it would be? Okay. How has running a successful business be different than you thought it was going to be? The, the truism that I've discovered across six entrepreneurial companies I've been in and hundreds I've seen is it will take longer, it will cost more, it will be more painful, and there are surprises out there that you can't dream of now, uh, bad surprises. And it's all a testimony a challenge to your ability to persist through all those things. You'll have a financial model that says you can get there on $100,000 or a million dollars or whatever. It's wrong. I don't know how it's wrong, but it's wrong. Um, and it's up to you to figure out, you know, the Pinterest story is a great one. A little bit of money left. How do you adjust? How do you lower the burn rate? How do you figure out, all right, market A, Solution A didn't work. How do we change the solution B? You know, that's the challenge, and all of you will face it because, based on my fairly sizable sample set, I haven't seen one that didn't. Um, so, you know, starting a company and running a company, I, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship and, and kind of wanted to go this direction, but I. I I will say I, I enjoy this aspect of it, but I but I will say it's it's it definitely is time consuming. It's like all encompassing. Like you fall asleep thinking about, at least I do, uh, thinking about what's gonna ha like what's going on. What are the problems you're facing? You kind of dream about it. You wake up thinking about it. Like th your whole life is kind of consumed with the company, which is kind of good in a way. But in terms of work life balance, is something you got to be conscious of. Um, trying to achieve. It's like actually difficult to achieve that. So um, that's one of the things that, that I kind of didn't necessarily realize in the beginning. And I wouldn't necessarily do it any different, but uh, something to be aware of. Um, I never thought I would have to fire anyone. And a lot of the time you're firing good people. Um, that's probably the worst part of my job. This is just from observing a bunch of really high-performing businesses and some things that haven't worked <coughs> out nearly how we thought they would, um, and trying to think about what separates those opportunities and, and those outcomes from each other. Uh, and, and probably what's become apparent to me over five years of doing this is that uh, it, it really goes back to what Dan just said. This is going to be your life. I mean, I think that, that people who, who entered into it under those expectations tend to do better. And the ones that demonstrate, you know, I think, I think the most important characteristic an entrepreneur can, can uh, exude is grit. Um, and, and there's a professor at Wharton named Angela Duckworth that, that writes and talks about this stuff. It's worth looking up. No, she's, she's put out some really good stuff as it ties to entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs and how they perform. Uh, but grit is going to be an incredibly dif you know, difficult thing to maintain over the course of building a business. And things are going to go wrong. Uh, they're absolutely going to go wrong. And, and how you react to those uh, is, is going to be key. And the companies that we've backed that have been successful, uh, they seem to have entrepreneurs that uh, are able to stomach, stomach that, uh, that failure along the way and really power through. So kind of a generalized answer, but uh, it's going to be harder than you think it is. It's going to take longer, as Gene said, uh, and being able to, to work your way through it uh, and, and just maintain your composure throughout is, is going to be critical. So, and, and I would add 
going through the process and building a company over 15 years, it is really, really hard getting that company up off the ground. And then you think you're at a point where it's, it's running pretty smoothly and you kind of disillusion yourself to think that it's going to get easier as it scales and grows. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. It, it, the, the, the pressure, the stress, the, the challenges may change, but because of your personality, because you're willing to do this, you're never happy. You're never satisfied. You want to continue to grow, to scale, to build a better business. So it never really quite gets as easy as you think it does after that first, that first phase. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Uh, we're right on time. We'll give uh, each of the panelists uh, an opportunity to say one final word of encouragement, and then, then we'll, we'll let everybody get on their way. So Dan, we'll start with you and work our way this way. Any last words of wisdom, encouragement? Uh, yeah. Don't uh, be afraid to fail. Uh, this is actually the best time in your life to uh, pursue something that's higher risk. Um, you can always fall back on your skills, uh, you know, to get kind of a standard job. But if, if, if this is a, like a direction you're thinking about going, just start right now and, uh, and, and get, get whatever you're working on in front of customers or potential users. And, and don't be afraid to fail. One thing will lead to another. Obviously, when I started, um, I didn't think we'd be where we are today. And when we were driving down College Ave in the, in the broken rental car, uh, we had no users really, no funding and nothing. So you just got to start. Um, that's what I'd say. I'd say you got to commit. Um, I can't tell you how many people uh, tell me they have a startup idea and they're going to do it on the side, keeping their safe corporate job. And then when the side project blows up, and they're going to make a smooth cut over. Never happens. You got to commit. If you're going to do it, you need to quit your job. So same theme. Uh, ideas are a dime a dozen. Uh, there's very few things that I hear that are, are really revolutionary. Uh, execution wins the day. It really is 1% idea and 99% execution. Uh, the, the number of people that I get to interact with that are, are, are doers is a lot less than the the number of people I interact with that are thinkers and, and, and dreamers. Uh, and, and not everyone's cut out to be an entrepreneur and build a business, and, and that's okay. Um, all of you in this, this room won't. There hopefully will be a handful of you that will. It's going to be a long and tough road. And, and uh, you know, the, the entrepreneurs that make it through, they deserve everything they get at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the rainbow because it's, it's, it's a rough ride. You just should think about that before you get into it and commit. Uh, and get ready for get ready for a for a you know a fun but uh, but certainly arduous path uh, and certainly rewarding if, if you can pull through. Uh, just to sort of build on these comments, I, I think it is a great time for you to go start a business. It is not the only time, so don't take this as some challenge that you have to go do it now. Maybe it is better for you, and this is a decision each of you has to make. Maybe you need to go work at a company, learn some skills, add to your skills, accumulate some money to go start your business. Any of those routes is fine. You are here because you are very interested in entrepreneurship, and I think that's great. One of the things John mentioned earlier, we didn't, at you know, the Penn State of not too long ago, and certainly long ago in my time, had no resources like this. You have so many more resources and skills you've learned and experiences you've built here. This panel never existed just several years ago. So. You, you, 